um, a little context uh, just to get started. So um, Mike and I agreed that, that we wanted to have a discussion that would keep pushing the ball forward on proposals for reform and change coming out of our discussion. And of course, um, we've both uh, known and worked with Chris for a very long time. Chris has been a major contributor to this initiative from the very beginning, including previous paper, was commissioned by, uh, by us. And so, um, of course, he turned me down. He turned us down uh, initially because he's a busy man, and so we had to really twist his arm. And I can't remember how we twisted your arm, Chris, but we got him to, uh, to commit. And uh, I don't think he has a finished draft yet, but still, um, it's, it's uh, I'm sure, going to be a great draft when it is finished. And we're looking forward to uh, hearing your thoughts. And thanks for agreeing to be here, Chris. Presidential reform of the regulatory state. Uh, it's going to take a little while for me to get up to the scrimmage line. Uh, let me uh, begin uh, by saying that this field government regulation uh, may be divided into two realms that have uh, distinct issues, arguments, proposals for uh, reform. You can think of them as the micro realm and the macro realm. Uh, the first micro involves the day-to-day -day work of the hundreds of regulatory agencies under the supervision of the White House, the Office of Information and Regulatory Affairs in OMB, OIRA, uh, and the judiciary. Uh, this world involves a host of uh, discrete, specific questions of right policy. Uh, the Obama administration had its clean power plan to address global warming. Uh, the Trump administration has replaced it with a clean and affordable power plan. And there's lots to be said about which of those is uh, better. Uh, the SEC has issued a fiduciary rule on the obligations of securities broker-dealers uh, to their customers that is very different from what came before. Uh, the FCC abolished the Obama administration's net neutrality rules. Uh, these are large and important areas of debate. There are occasions when, within the executive branch, questions of right policy uh, overlap with questions of uh, procedure. Uh, Peter Wallison mentioned uh, one of those uh, during the Obama years, a new, a radically new uh, 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 institution of, uh, at college campuses uh, for uh, policing and uh, uh, sanctioning uh, cases of sexual abuse uh, was uh, in instituted by the federal government. Uh, there was no rulemaking. There was no adjudication. There was just a letter, a mass mailing of a dear colleague letter, uh, which implied that if you don't do what we say, uh, we're going to consider where your, whether your college continues to get federal uh, grants. Um, uh, currently, uh, if you are a manufacturer of vaping uh, devices, uh, you may not advertise what you believe to be the health benefits of switching from smoking to vaping. It's not written down in a rule any place. It's completely unpublished. It is because the Food and Drug Administration has made it clear in private meetings, uh, as I understand it, uh, that uh, the life or death powers that it has over the future of uh, vaping uh, will be exercised uh, in formal proceedings <coughs> in adverse ways uh, if, uh, the, uh, if the firms do not uh, behave uh, as uh, the agency uh, wants. So there are these uh, procedural questions, but they're all within the executive branch. And there are also in the executive branch reform initiatives, the Reagan cost-benefit program, which has uh, persisted since then, uh, Trump, the Trump administration overlay of a regulatory budget, uh, whether these are good or bad ideas, whether they're going to produce uh, uh, helpful uh, results. Uh, <clears throat> the second macro world uh, is adumbrated in the uh, rather frightening term, the regulatory state. Uh, which is sometimes expressed as the executive state or 
the administrative state. And here we are uh, concerned with the emergence over the past century, but uh, with particular drama over the last uh, 40 or 50 years, uh, with a new form of federal government uh, that is highly discretionary and autonomous and is centralized in one of the three constitutional branches, the executive branch, uh, that has come to uh, combine its uh, standard functions of administration and enforcement uh, with the process of lawmaking and law amendment uh, that was traditionally the function of the Congress and the function of legal interpretation and adjudication of specific claims uh, that were traditionally the work of the judiciary. The regulatory state has been and its implications for the rule of law and constitutional traditions has been uh, a strong component of the Hoover project over the years and it is the subject of my paper. In this second field, uh, the regulatory state, the predominant debates and criticism uh, is, const is legal and constitutional. It is about this uh, consolidation of lawmaking, enforcement, and adjudication in executive agencies. Uh, it is said to be an affront to the separation of powers. Uh, we have all our favorite quotes uh, from the Federalist uh, papers on this. The predominant reforms are accordingly, that is following from this assessment, that the other two branches that have, uh, uh, have become uh, meek and timid and uh, uh, faded into the background should reassert themselves, that they, we should, uh, through the mechanism of the judiciary and the legislature, uh, have a restored separation and balance of powers. The courts ought to revive the non-delegation doctrine uh, and uh, tighten up their various uh, agency deferent, deference doctrines. That is the uh, teaching of Peter Wallison's book uh, that he uh, summarized. Uh, we got a Supreme Court decision on one part of that uh, yesterday. We're going to get another Supreme Court decision touching another aspect, aspect of it probably uh, next week. At the same time, the Congress should pull up its institutional socks. <laughs> it should make more of the hard policy choices itself. Uh, it should revise the Administrative Procedure Act uh, so as to introduce into executive branch uh, lawmaking a greater degree of due process. And it should insist on reviewing and approving or disapproving major agency rules by referral under programs uh, such as the various proposed RAINS Act proposals, regulations from the executive in need of scrutiny. I subscribe wholeheartedly to this critique. Uh, I think it's about much more than uh, organizational um, punctiliousness, uh, maintaining fidelity to the original uh, understanding of the original text. Uh, I think that the concentration of power in one branch has produced manifold uh, abuses uh, that are precisely what the constitutional scheme was meant to avert. Uh, most of all, I agree with Peter Wallison and others, uh, that the decline of representative government uh, and its displacement by autonomous executive government is an important source of today's political polarization and the decline in uh, what he calls democratic uh, legitimacy. Others have written uh, to, uh, uh, on the same ilk, myself, uh, Peter Wallach of the R Street, Phil Wallach of the R Street Institute and others. But my view is that the constitutional critique is incomplete and inadequate to the nature and problems of the regulatory state. Um, uh, the central uh, idea behind the constitutional argument is that we made an intellectual wrong turn uh, about 130, 40 years ago, beginning with some academic writings of Woodrow Wilson. Uh, that uh, this idea, this progressive idea of uh, uh, consolidating government, uh, taking it out of the hands of, uh, of, uh, uh, of buffoonish amateur <laughs> pals uh, in the Congress and turning it over to neutral, uh, scientific, flexible, fast-moving uh, authorities uh, in administrative agencies uh, was uh, necessary 
uh, to deal with all of the complexities and challenges of modern life. Um, I don't think that's it at all. Uh, I think that the regulatory state is the result of material developments, powerful social, economic, and technological developments. Uh, first, the growth of incomes and wealth, of leisure time, of the division of labor, uh, so that many, many, a much larger share of the population is actively interested in and involved in politics. And with the rise of incomes, the displacement of traditional issues that were the centerpiece of what the federal government did in domestic affairs. <laughs> Employment, the prerogatives of management versus labor, the regulation of utilities and so forth, with new issues uh, beginning almost exactly in 1970 and gather gathering uh, pace after that of environmentalism, uh, personal health uh, and safety, uh, group discrimination, uh, group and personal identity, uh, personal dignity and access, uh, raising a profusion of new and different issues, sometimes called values uh, issues, alongside of the traditional economic ones. And this combined with the progress of technology, especially in recent decades of uh, communications technology, those of mass communications and networked communications, which taken together have dramatically reduced the transaction costs of politics and what might be called the market for policy. Uh, so that, um, well, let me put it this way. Uh, the progressive view is that things really got underway during the New Deal. Uh, but, you know, during the New Deal, there was nobody that was concerned about environmental quality. And if they were, they would not, I mean, smoke, smokestacks were something that people wanted more of in the New Deal. Uh, and if there, there was a Sierra Club, but it, you know, it made calendars and it was about conservation. Uh, if there were such people, uh, if there, or if there were people who were concerned with all of the modern ideas uh, and concerns of identity politics, it would have been almost impossible for them to identify other people in America and form uh, coalitions. Uh, it is now possible for almost any, even very slight, cause, complaint, enthusiasm uh, to find a sufficient number of people uh, uh, develop uh, consciousness as a political cause, uh, take their place uh, in the public square, impose their uh, demands upon the Congress. Uh, and the same changes have atomized the political system and the Congress, uh, so that the old hierarchies of committees and strong chairmen, political parties, uh, have been uh, replaced by an atomized form of Congress, so that Congress people are essentially solo entrepreneurs uh, with their specialized uh, interest group and ideological uh, support groups uh, who can uh, advance many, many more items on the congressional agenda uh, than could ever be done in the past. But Congress remains the cumbersome, inefficient, bicameral institution uh, that the uh, that the founders uh, designed. In any event, it's a legislature, and it's, it's riven with uh, conflicts uh, and differences of interests and uh, values. It could not possibly handle the thousands of new issues that come pouring into it every day. It has responded by delegating lawmaking. It has delegated it to specialized, missionary, cause-specific executive agencies that can be multiplied essentially uh, without limit. So in my view, I don't think that progressive theory has played no role in this, but I regard it as primarily not a cause uh, of the executive state, but a rationalization for what has come about for material uh, reasons. And I think that the key to the power of executive government is not, as the progressives would have it, expertise, this idea that people that were in possession of kind of autonomous, self-contained, in some sense, scientific bodies of knowledge that could solve problems, could, uh, could apply these in ways that would be beneficial to all of us. Uh, there are a few areas of, of, I think, genuine expertise in the executive branch. 
Uh, I would say that the FDA and the uh, Federal Reserve Board uh, uh, employ a significant amount of expertise. EPA has some research labs, but for the most part, the regulators, they don't have expertise. They rely for expert knowledge on the parties that come into them. I mean, read a rulemaking proceeding. It's all, if they're talking about regulating this, that, or the, all of the information was submitted to them uh, by outside parties. The key is instead the very different idea, in fact, almost the opposite of expertise, specialization. Uh, the people that make the decisions in the regulatory areas on, uh, uh, on uh, hundreds and hundreds of issues, each one of them is specialized in the details of their program. They know the statutes. They know the case law. They know who are their friends and foes in the Congress. They know who they're, who's cooperative and uncooperative out there in the regulated stakeholder uh, community. Um, and many of them could be, many of them were recently congressional staffers, member of, members of this uh, amateur uh, branch of government. Specialization is a central and beneficial, familiar feature of economic markets. In law and politics, it is a source of many troubles. It is unrepresentative, it is insular, uh, and it is prone to going to extremes and making accidents. Uh, in doing things that uh, no generalist uh, legislature uh, would ever countenance. I've got a long list of examples. I want to move on with my general argument, uh, which is that as in economics, specialization is the source of tremendous dynamism, resilience, and growth. And uh, Bob Topel has given us a beautiful, elegant uh, model uh, for the dynamism of uh, this combination. Uh, 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 of uh, different kinds of government power in agencies that have strong incentives uh, for growth and are subject to supervision by agents uh, that have only words at their command. And when it comes to Congress, democratic words, uh, which means not so much that they will be vague, but that they will be uh, uh, highly ambiguous. You have many statutes where they have a lot of standards, but they have th but they have three or four, and they point in different directions, and they're mutually uh, inconsistent. Uh, this view of the nature of the regulatory state suggests to me that the standard ideas of reviving judicial review and congressional uh, self uh, self regard uh, uh, hold very limited uh, potential. I think the courts uh, ought to. Uh, and I think that they may uh, dust off the non-delegation doctrine, uh, revise uh, the uh, administrative law doctrines, Chevron and others, of broad deference to uh, agency uh, discretion. But as, as was reviewed in the uh, conversation earlier this afternoon, courts are just institutionally incapable of, of going very far, far in countering the powerful institutional dynamics of the regulatory state and the many methods that the agencies have developed. I've mentioned a few uh, for achieving their proceedings uh, without uh, the courts having any idea what they are up to. Uh, the public proceedings, rulemaking, adjudication uh, are, are subject to judicial review uh, but occur vastly greater in the frequency than appellate courts can uh, supervise and they have uh, an an array, an amazing array, if you have to almost work in Washington to understand it, of informal uh, sub-regulatory devices. I referred to the FDA and, uh, uh, and to the Office for Civil Rights that are almost never justiciable, uh, justiciable in, uh, in Article III uh, courts. Um, and uh, uh, much of it is done by uh, we had, I was at a conference at Adams Institution the other day uh, where these uh, techniques were described as secret law. It is a big form of law. If anybody works before OSHA or NHTSA or the FDA, you know the secret law. And you know one part of the secret law is you challenge the agency out in the open. If you win, you lose. Everybody understands that. Another slogan is the process is the punishment. This is a big part of what, uh, uh, what the uh, agencies do. Uh, and finally, the line drawing problem, which we also uh, discussed. If you tried to come up with a principle-lined 
line drawing problem for non-delegation. It would not discriminate between agencies that do and do not have powerful roots in American political culture. Uh, and you saw some of this hesitation, I think, on the part of all members of the Supreme Court. If they start coming up with abstract you know, doctrines of non-delegation, they've got to ask themselves, did I just hold that the Federal Reserve Board is unconstitutional? You know, what's the difference between this case and that case? Very hard to describe, to decide these things in the abstract. Congress is a bad a savior uh, from the regulatory state because it's the proximate cause of the regulatory state. It is the intermediary between the economic and technological developments I've emphasized and this huge armada of specialized, missionary, uh, discretionary, growing uh, lawmaking uh, agencies. The same incentives that have led them to uh, broad and abundant regulation uh, uh, is uh, going to lead them to reject efforts to reverse course. Uh, ideas of re changing the Administrative Procedure Act to inject more uh, formality, more procedures, more due process. They've been around almost since the Administrative Procedure Act was passed in the late 1940s, uh, and uh, they've never gone. They've never gone uh, anywhere. Um, uh, these these ideas, like the Reins procedure, uh, have essentially been partisan messaging votes in recent uh, Congresses. Uh, when the Republicans, who were supposed to be in favor of this, had had the whole government to themselves in two years. Uh, the idea that they were going to pass reins, everybody said, no, 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 we don't, we don't want to do that. All of the members, across, not all of them, many of the members across the political spectrum have accommodated themselves. There's an evolved new business model on the Hill, which is expansive lawmaking delegation, followed by pro and con partisan uh, criticism or applause for whatever is happening downtown uh, in a given week. Uh, and abundant agency lobbying uh, on behalf of support groups. Um, uh, when it, this has happened in recent years. Uh, several people who've gone into the Trump administration working on regulatory policy, they were amazed to find out that the people that mostly want to come see them are congressmen. It's congressmen and senators that want to come see them, usually with a, a supporter constituent uh, in tow, to talk about you know, lobbying for some decision. So they've become lobbyists with badges, uh, so to speak. That's going to be very, very hard to, uh, to undo. You can see uh, uh, the House has put together, I think, a pretty impressive congressional modernization uh, project uh, that's trying to do some reforms. My friends that work on APA reform are always telling me how a big breakthrough is coming. God bless them. Uh, more, more power to them. Uh, but I maintain in this paper, and now I'm up to the scrivage line, that it is time to consider auxiliary strategies. My argument is that the institution best equipped to confront the problems and dynamics of the regulatory state is actually the presidency. That will seem counterintuitive, uh, far-fetched, would be another term, uh, to many people because the president and the regulatory and administrative agencies cohabit the same constitutional branch. Uh, the actions of the president and the agencies are often confounded and described in the same sentence uh, in uh, news reports, academic papers, uh, and other words. Uh, and in fact, if you look at the evolution of the presidency, recent presidents, uh, and I'd say that this uh, got underway in the Reagan administration, but has become very pronounced under Obama and Trump, uh, increasingly act not as CEOs of the executive branch or chiefs of state, uh, but, as, uh, uh, but as political uh, partisans. Uh, they use selectively uh, their, uh, among their abundant uh, unilateral legal authorities uh, in political uh, fashion to fortify uh, partisan uh, coalitions. Uh, do things that their party really wants done, but nobody wants to vote on uh, up on Capitol Hill. But the president's political interests often conflict with those of the bureaucracy uh, that nominally uh, reports to him. Uh, uh, Donald Trump is not the first president 
uh, to be actively opposed and undermined by the deep state. Um, the divergence, uh, I acknowledge, is far more pronounced in the case of presidents who are anti-Washington, drain the swamp populists. Uh, these days, those uh, tend almost exclusively to be Republicans. Uh, Democrats, especially now under the control of the progressive left, uh, have more than made their peace uh, with the regulatory state. It's part and parcel of their political strategies. However, we have had several Republican, Republican Washington reform, anti-regulation presidents uh, in recent decades. Uh, the anti-Washington animus is strong. It seems to be a durable one in American politics. It is not completely crazy uh, that the evolution of the Democratic Party could find new energy in picking up on it. My precedent is from the micro world of regulation. Ronald Reagan's uh, establishment in 1981 of a program of White House review of agency rules under a cost-benefit standard. Uh, during the 1970s, I'm the only one in the room, I was actually there on the scene, uh, there was this robust regulatory reform movement, and it had a lot to teach the agencies and Congress, um, and uh, all of our reform ideas addressed to the agencies and Congress uh, fell on deaf ears. Nobody was interested. We had one big success, airline deregulation in the 1980s. Otherwise, uh, nothing, nothing was happening. But then we began to notice that Presidents Nixon and then Ford and then Carter were starting to review individual rules which were being issued in profusion suddenly uh, by these newer uh, uh, agencies of health, safety, and environment. Um, uh, mainly under uh, an economic standard, often by economists that had some background uh, in our movement. And so our attention, hey, there's somebody who's actually paying it, the president, the White House, they're actually paying attention. Let's work with them. And we came up with this uh, review uh, program, uh, and with the election of Ronald Reagan, uh, it could be put in place. Uh, it has not been a panacea. Uh, but it has produced some substantial reforms, and it has endured through six presidencies, uh, ranging from conservative Republican to liberal uh, Democrat. Now, the issues we're dealing with in the regulatory state are much larger. They're much more momentous. They're concerned with questions of political uh, legitimacy, constitutional fidelity. Uh, uh, but, um, uh, and I'm going to give you particulars, but my basic point is that that precedent can be applied to uh, today's issues, uh, that the president can do a lot exercising completely uncontroversial statutory and uh, constitutional authorities to advance reforms that are currently being addressed to Congress and to the judiciary. They're not going to appeal to every president. Some presidents are not going to like them at all or presidential aspirants, but they could appear to some. But we don't know, because we're not talking about any of these reforms as the sort of things a president can do. They are not in the academic think tank toolkit of ideas that we prepare and burnish, waiting for the day when the practical politicians uh, will find it expedient to uh, climb onto them. I have three sets of reforms. Of reforms. Uh, the first is for the president to accomplish by executive order uh, many of the reforms, as chief executive of the executive branch, many of the reforms to agency rulemaking uh, that have been thought of as revisions that we have to do through the Administrative Procedure Act. For example, a long-standing proposal is to formalize rulemaking. Uh, under the Administrative Procedure Act, you can actually have formal rulemaking proceedings. Uh, and you have traditional, uh, not traditional, I'll just say trial-like uh, adversarial procedures, uh, the clash of lawyers' arguments. You have uh, real standards of evidence. You have cross-examination of uh, witnesses. Or you can just have informal rulemaking, where basically you announce what you want to do, you canvass for memos, you read the memo, called notice and comment, you read the comments, you talk about, you know, well, you thought a lot about the comments and you've decided to do this, law of the land. Um, 
Not uh, surprisingly, the agencies like uh, informal rulemaking. It is much more expeditious. It gives them much wider latitude in compiling and interpreting a record uh, that supports the policies uh, that they want. But the president could direct by executive order that they use the discretion that the APA gives them to use formal rulemaking for a specific category of major rulemakings uh, that would provide greater protections for individual rights uh, and that we know are much better at ferreting out a weak and tendentious uh, science and other evidence which is rife uh, in the world of informal uh, rulemaking. There are many other examples. Let me just give you uh, a couple. Uh, one proposal has been to replace the uh, APA's arbitrary and uh, or arbitrary or capricious or abusive discretion standard of judicial review with uh, a form of a cost-benefit test. You have to make a reasonable demonstration that the benefits are likely to uh, outweigh the uh, costs. Uh, but the courts have been moving in the direction of interpreting the arbitrary and capricious standard in just that way uh, in recent years. The executive branch could do a lot if the president required, for example, that agencies state their rulemaking conclusions under their organic statutes in terms in the terms of what they have discovered through the regulatory analyses that the president himself has required them to perform. The Trump administration has started moving in that direction. Let me give you one uh, tactic of secret law. What agencies love to do when they issue a rule, final rule, especially a big one, is to set an effective date that is sure to come before legal review has been exhausted, and then to let their major quake quote, stakeholders know that they would look with favor on these firms if they came into compliance, even as they argued about these details, such as whether the rule is lawful in the first place, uh, before the uh, judges. Uh, the Supreme Court, uh, EPA went a little too far on this, and the Supreme Court caught them uh, and uh, uh, countered uh, this uh, in uh, the Obama administration's uh, clean uh, power plant uh, case. But the president could make it executive branch policy that agency rules may not go into effect before the courts have found that the rules are in fact lawful. Uh, my personal favorite is a 15-year sunset for major new rules. It's never even made it into the uh, uh, reported out uh, APA uh, reforms. Um, but new rules are almost always a result of gross estimates of their benefits and costs. Uh, they often turn out to be wide of the mark. Fifteen laters, years later, we've got actual evidence, and the world has moved on. We have, actually have something to go on uh, to require that rules periodically be uh, revisited, uh, reproposed, re-justified, or allowed to expire would be a great amplification of what almost every administration has done, most recently Obama, of going back and looking for obsolete and crummy old regulations and uh, getting rid of them. It would be a great compliment to the Trump regulatory budget. Um, I'm going to move on here pretty quickly, but I need a few more minutes. Charlie, is that okay? Um, my second one, cons I've been talking about rulemaking, where the agencies announce rules. Uh, another huge part of the regulatory state is adjudication, uh, where agencies, uh, where uh, decisions are made about agency enforcement actions, such as the FTC staff, Federal Trade Commission staff, has a complaint about deceptive advertising or unfair commercial practices, or the SEC staff has complaints of securities fraud or inadequate uh, disclosure, or there are cases where private parties uh, come in with complaints against the uh, agency's enforcement procedures or policies. Uh, the, the relatively famous case of uh, the Sacketts uh, versus EPA from a few years is an example of that. Um, these cases are decided by the agent, for the most part, by the agency's own in-house administrative law judges. The judges have offices right down the hall from the people that are bringing the, uh, bringing the order. And if the head of the agency doesn't like the decision of the administrative law judge, uh, he or she can just overrule them, just boom, uh, to just uh, change it. Uh, this uh, uh, incestuous uh, adjudication of private rights, 
and obligations is a pretty obvious uh, affront uh, to traditional due process norms. It's been around for a long time, since the very early days of uh, regulation before the modern rulemaking era. Uh, there is, in my view, strong evidence, not uh, beyond controversy by any means, uh, that in-house judging is strongly biased in favor of agency prerogatives. And when you have a procedure where the decision of this adjudication with all of its formal rules and so forth can just be overruled, you know, with a <coughs> stamp by the head of the agency, uh, it seems to me to be approaching something of a uh, sham. Uh, there have been a variety of proposals over the years to move adjudication uh, to independent Article Three, or sometimes this funny species of Article I courts uh, by statute. Uh, uh, Adam's uh, colleague, uh, Michael Grieva, has a big uh, paper uh, on the subject recently. But the president could do a lot of this through internal executive branch management. Not all, but a lot. The first step would be take all of these administrative law judges and move them physically out of their agencies to common offices in a separate regulatory court building somewhere downtown with its own hearing rooms, uh, its own administrative structure, its own cafeteria where SEC and FDA and EPA and OSHA judges can have lunch, develop a little spree, a little uh, uh, spirit of uh, independence. Uh, what? That's <laughs> really a lot of fun. Um, they're, they're fun guys and gals. Um, there are a lot of ancillary steps. Uh, there's a funny, uh, very informal species of administrative judges, uh, which have much less uh, statutory protection against uh, agency retaliation for decisions that the agency doesn't like. Um, promote them all to administrative law judges. Give them more uh, protection. Uh, the most important, and there's some flexibility in the statutes, not complete, but there's some, uh, is to have these judges ride circuit. Have them deciding not just SEC or EPA cases, but an FDA case this week and a, and a NHTSA case next week, and to bring back not only independence, but the idea of generalist uh, judging uh, in favor of captured and specialized uh, judging. Uh, all of these important steps toward the rule of law. Now I'm going to conclude uh, with, um, I, I wanted to leave not much time for my most troublesome proposal. Uh, which is the most uh, ambitious, and that is for the president to re refer major rules to the Congress for statutory enactment or, through an action, rejection. Uh, I mentioned RAINS uh, before. Uh, these bills would require major agency rules before they could go into effect to be approved by both houses through expedited up or down floor votes signed by the president, but that would be a foregone conclusion if they came from the executive branch. But Mitt Romney, when he was running for president in 2012, he said that even in the absence of the RAIN statute, he was going to refer all major executive branch rules for approval to Congress, even without uh, a prior uh, congressional uh, uh, statute. My proposal is to follow through uh, on this uh, perhaps uh, casual uh, idea that uh, Senator Romney made back then. It has profound problems and it has profound potential and importance. Uh, it would be hugely controversial in Congress. Our Congress is not used to taking votes on complex, controversial matters. Uh, I, a year ago, President Trump used an established procedure to propose approval of 15 billion, in Washington that's nothing, of rescissions. Uh, to appropriations that had been made, bipartisan outrage. Who does he think he is telling us, you know, asking us to actually vote on these uh, things? Uh, it, was, it was quite dramatic, and they would like this proposal uh, even less. I think the initial idea would simply be to ignore the presidential uh, referrals uh, to uh, get them to back off, but there could be counter strategies. The, the presidents go back and they come up with these collections of silly old rules, but then they to and they advertise them. Uh, uh, when Cass Sunstein was head of OIRA, he talked for three years about a EPA rule that had mistakenly classified milk as a hazardous 
or as a hazardous oil. And there were all these incredibly elaborate procedures that had been adopted to deal with transporting milk. Um, and so they got rid of it. But you had to go through the Administrative Procedure Act to get rid of it. Take a whole parcel of these things, send them up to Congress, let Congress kill these things without going through the Administrative Procedure Act, give them all something to brag about, about standing up to the idiotic uh, bureaucrats. Uh, over time, uh, the, the idea would be to overcome any uh, uh, congressional uh, sabotage uh, maneuvers uh, and send up lots and lots of uh, rules on important major uh, uh, things that need to have decisions and let the country know uh, that the president has put together what he thinks is the right policy, but he thinks that it is important enough that it deserves a congressional vote, uh, and uh, try to get them used to this, this strange business of making compromises, settling for half loaves, uh, suffering the tweets of disappointed support groups, and yet living to politic another day. Um, big problems for the executive branch uh, as well. If you if you'd said, well, I'm going to just send up the ones that I want, well, that would undermine the whole process, which is to kind of reconstitutionalize uh, uh, at least an important part of federal uh, lawmaking. It would open it up to charges of, no doubt, corrective political opportunism. It would undermine the larger purposes. But if you said, I'm going to refer all major rules, uh, and there are established definitions for this, significant rules, whatever it is, it would threaten to undo many important administration initiatives. Uh, the staffs at the agencies in the White House working with the stakeholder groups uh, would, uh, would go crazy. Um, the, the Obama administration uh, issued some not even close to uh, achievable CAFE standards, automobile uh, emission, uh, 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 fuel economy uh, standards. The Trump administration is going to propose to uh, change them. It will be a major rule. If you set it up to Congress today, Cong the Democrats would just ignore it because then they get the Obama rule. So you've got all sorts of these uh, very serious uh, problems. And so I want to acknowledge <coughs> that uh, the idea of a modern president uh, becoming a, uh, a resolute and occasionally uh, self denying constitutional head of state is something that takes uh, some uh, imagination. Uh, but uh, one of the purposes of this paper is to introduce this unfamiliar concept and to get people uh, arguing about it. A central purpose of these proposals is, to, is not just to get Congress to take votes, it's for the agencies to conceive of their mission when they're writing laws as to write is writing uh, rules uh, that depart from their specialized missionary uh, mindsets uh, and would be policies that actually had a good chance of getting two majorities, including some votes from the people of the, uh, the other party. Uh, and the fact is, if you get into the details of these things, um, uh, the Democrats in Congress have a lot of constituency constituents that make automobiles, uh, and uh, the politics of the cafe reform would be a welcome departure from the knee-jerk partisanship that we see. Regulatory politics is often interest group rather than uh, partisan politics. So I think that these considerations suggest that a concerted policy is at least possible. Uh, the idea is that there are huge issues of addressing uh, climate change uh, or um, uh, the new array of uh, drugs and biologics that are coming on the market or dealing with the, the, pro the, the manifold problems of the organization of the Internet and the big tech companies and privacy and political issues. These are big national issues. The way we're operating now, Congress isn't going to do much about any of them. They're all going to be done by... Uh, specialized uh, executive agencies, and getting back to a system where uh, uh, representative legislatures vote on these things, so whether we like or hate the policies, we at least know what the procedures were, and it was not done by secret law. It was done by voters, some of which agree with me, some of which don't agree with me. Uh, that's Getting back to that is a big problem.
in our political system, it requires executive action that does not face the jurisdictional limitations of courts, the immense collective actions of the Congress, where we have big national problems. We depend on presidential leadership. And what I'm trying to do is to get people thinking about the problems of the regulatory state as things that could actually be amenable to presidential leadership. Thank you. Uh, to, explain, to explain everything I'd agree with in Chris's paper would take an hour. I don't have an hour. I have about five minutes. And so I'll focus on the things that I disagree with, um, or focus mainly on those things. Uh, and my disagreements are pretty fundamental. Last time at the workshop, I joked that my disagreements started about halfway through uh, Chris's first paragraph. It occurred to me rereading the I paper. I reorganized things. So well, reorganized. it didn't help because it, it occurred to me rereading um, the paper for this that actually my disagreement begins about halfway through the title. Um, but I think it's an, it's an important uh, difference of what exactly we're getting at here. Um, but let me start with my main agreements. In addition to points about um, the mindset of a regulatory specialist, which I think is an important insight here, and even something like where we locate ALJs making a difference, just the sociology of mm -hmm. bureaucracy. Mm -hmm. I think those are crucial insights. And my main, you know, I agree with, your, with a lot of your main thrusts that the president can and should do a lot to rein in the regulatory state. And OIRA is, of course, the classic example. There's a lot of people in this room uh, who were directly involved with and led the process of reforming or creating OIRA, building, as you said, on what had come before in previous administrations. Um, I think the thing that everybody needs to read on the history of OIRA is the writings of Andrew Rudolovich of Bowdoin College. He's written in National Affairs and in the Journal of Policy History on what it really meant to create OIRA and why OIRA was a successful institution. The fact that it wasn't just sort of written on a blank slate, that the Reagan administration at its most energetic moment when it was new in office took what was already working in sort of a nebulous way from the Nixon administration's quality of life reviews onward. They took that and they institutionalized it, which is crucial. They didn't just sort of create processes, but they created a real institution inside of the White House. And then they lent political capital to seeing it through as a success over one year, over eight years, over 12 years, so much so that when President Clinton took over, he didn't get rid of it. He took it, he reformed it, and built on what came before. Um, that point about institution building, I think, is crucial. It always, I was always sort of amused by the way Steve Bannon formulated the point they were going to deconstruct the administrative state. That just strikes me as totally wrong. You don't deconstruct these things. What you do is you construct institutions that have the reforms you want. It's not about deconstructing an administrative state. It's about constructing or reconstructing some other kind of state, a re lower R Republican state, a lower D Democrat state, whatever you want to call it. It's about building institutions, and OIRA is the classic example. Now, my concerns here are that there are limits to presidential-centric uh, reforms. Um, so much of what Chris is proposing here, I like the ideas, but the reason why these things seem so novel is that they, they presume or they count on presidential self-restraint. And obviously, the president should be self-restrained in the same way that all three branches of government should be self-restrained. Um, we need that, but we can't always count on it, especially on the most important things. And, and Chris's proposals here, by contrast, they depend on immense presidential self-restraint. Um, proposals to send rules to Congress assume that the president is willing to restrain himself and not carry out his most important initiatives if one house of Congress won't act on it. Chris's um, idea of, of putting in subset rules for new regulations presumes self-restraint by the subsequent president to not just uh, do away with a sunset rule. Um, if, if that president wants to see the rule uh, stay in place. And so we have, but we have experience in presidential-centric uh, reforms. Chris, um, when he described his reforms as counterintuitive, I thought actually they're very intuitive because the last four decades have been president-centric reforms more than anything else. Yeah, our friends in, on, on, on Capitol Hill talk about reforms, um, and they propose some great ones, but the fact is what's really gone into effect more than anything has been um, OIRA onward. We've tried president-centric reforms for four <coughs> decades, and they've had some really great effects, but on the whole, they've not reined in the administrative state. If anything, <coughs> the rise of those institutions has, in many, the, the rise of the president-centric approach has coincided with the administrative state's growth and acceleration and innovation. And I think that one of the lessons we should learn from that is that plans for leveraging presidential <coughs> power may in the long run benefit the growth of the administrative state more than its limitations. 
Um, okay, so my fundamental concern, I'll focus on this for the rest of my time. Um, back to Chris's first sentence. You say the most promising means of correcting the problems <laughs> of the regulatory state are unilateral presidential action. I think the problem is unilateral presidential action. Um, and I think that's a problem in a way because I think I see it as the cause of what you also see as the real problem here, the, def the def deformation of Congress, right, the, 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 this desiccated Congress that no longer acts as the first branch in the policymaking process in, the, in this country. Um, my view of it is, my, my hypothesis is that the more the president does, the less Congress does. When presidents, they love to say, if Congress won't act, then I will, it actually gets it backwards. And then, in fact, it's because presidents can act and can act so swiftly through their agencies that Congress is relieved of the hydraulic forces that would otherwise push Congress to make national policy and to go through the things that Congress has to go through, namely compromise and so on, deliberation, to make policy. I think we saw that just a few months ago in the debates over the border wall, where there was legislative debate in the Senate over whether to fund this new border wall. And it was pretty clear everybody in the Senate was just sitting there looking around waiting for the president to do something unilaterally that they would all react to. In fact, some of the right. senators said right. the president should act. Right. And not to oversimplify it, but I think that was, there was a lot of that happening in the first months of 2009 when President Obama said to two Democratic houses of Congress, you need to legislate on climate policy uh, or else my EPA will act. And the second half of that instruction released any real sense of urgency in Congress. There was no urgency for Democrats, for, 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 for um, oh, what's his name in Michigan, he's recently passed away, Dingell, to, to negotiate with Seth Waxman, let alone the Democrats negotiating with Republicans. Right? There was no reason for anybody to really compromise and stick out their necks in what might get them a primary challenge, because we all knew that the Obama administration was going to move forward on climate policy. There was no doubt about that. And so because the EPA could act based on the, the legislation of previous Congresses, um, there's no real urgency in Congress to act. And I think that is sort of the key um, dynamic in our politics today. Congress won't act because presidents and their agencies will, based on the accumulation of decades upon decades of statutes that now have their own uh, gravitational pull on the legislative process going forward. Chris, in his paper, and I really hope you'll download it and read it, beginning at page 6, he, he, um, he walks through some of the vices of regulatory policy making. You say or in specialized agency lawmaking. You say it's unrepresentative, it's declarative, it's relatively efficient, it's malleable and mercurial, it's insular. That all rings a bell with me. Like Tara, I brought my copy of The Federalist. Unlike Tara, I'm not going to hit Will with it, at least not right now. Um, but what your description of specialized rulemaking reminds me of those famous lines in Federalist 70 about the energetic executive. Hamilton writes, decision, activity, secrecy, and dispatch will generally characterize the proceedings of one man, the president. That was, that was the virtue of executive power, right? And so when you describe the vices of specialized agency rulemaking, in a way, you're describing the virtues of presidential action. And it reminds us that in the end, even with the efforts of now, next two years from now, 75 years of the APA and 40 years of, of White House reforms, that at the end of the day, the regulatory process is still going to look more like executive power and legislative or adjudicatory power. And that's a good thing, right? It should look like executive power because ultimately it is executive power. The question then is what do we want those agencies to do with that power? Um, and I don't think Congress is going to get itself out of this cul-de-sac for precisely the reasons I described. Congress is broken. It, they're going to require a nudge out of this cul-de-sac. And so I'm led uneasily to the solution that Peter was discussing earlier today and which I think conservatives will be spending a lot of time in the next couple of years talking about not just conservatives, everybody, the non-delegation doctrine. I say I come to this point uneasily um, for all the reasons that Justice Scalia was uneasy about the non-delegation doctrine, not just in Whitman, but in those articles he was writing 40 years ago in, an art, in a magazine I know you know well, uh, Regulation Magazine, where Scalia, Professor Scalia said, non-delegation doctrine is extremely important. Um, courts should not be enforcing it. Because for courts to draw these lines based on to draw lines that aren't clearly rooted in constitutional text just repeats the errors of the Warren Court. Um, Scalia had a real point. Um, Peter Wallison wrote a great book on judicial fortitude. I'm all for that. But I also understand that the better part of valor is discretion, um, especially when it comes to the courts. And so courts need to have fortitude, but they also need to be very, very careful about what they're doing here. Um, I could go on and on. Alexander Conn raised good points about this in Peter's Q&A 
James Madison in Federalist 37, which Gorsuch quotes in his opinion yesterday, he, were, he warned us, again, in Federalist 37, no skill in the science of government has yet been able to discriminate and define with sufficient certainty its three great provinces, the legislative, executive, and judiciary. So I understand that in urging the courts to think more seriously about the non-delegation doctrine, I'm asking them to do uh, what they've never really been able to do before, all the way back to the cargo of the Brig Aurora. But we have run this experiment now for about 90 years in terms of this form of, ru of rulemaking. Chris traced it to the Reagan administration. We can trace it further. I mean, what the Reagan administration was doing was pursuing Reaganite ends by Rooseveltian means, right, just using these sort of tools and attitudes towards the administrative agencies that Roosevelt and his administration pioneered. They got a little pushback originally in 1935 and then no longer. Um, I don't know that it's going to be possible for five, let alone seven or nine justices, to coalesce around a non-delegation doctrine at any point. But I think they should try. I think it's important because, um, as Stanford Law School's former dean, John Hart Ely, pointed out, the court at its best oftentimes is helping to make the democratic process the best version of itself. And of course, that can go horribly awry. But I think it's true, especially in terms of preserving the separation of powers that pr and federalism, that process by which our democracy um, translates passion into reason. I hope the court goes about its work on the non-delegation with that in mind, thinking about recalibrating the non-delegation doctrine with an eye to improving our democratic process. They didn't in Gandhi. They might next term or the term after that in a case called American Institute for International Steel. This is Alan Morrison's case on the yeah. national security tariffs. I think it's up on cert right now, but in a very preliminary posture, so the court might wait a year or two and let these things percolate. But only then will we begin to correct, in Chris's terms, the pro problems of the regulatory state. And that's my qualm, my last point, my qualm with the title. Maybe you and I are just getting at two different things. Um, sometimes we throw around these terms regulatory state and administrative state as synonyms. They're not really. Uh, at least not as I see it. Uh, the regulatory state is, is an issue of substance. It's too many regulations coming out of Washington, burdening individuals and the private sector and everybody else. Of course, regulations can come, in a sense, from Congress, right? I'm much less worried about that, with all due respect to my friends at the Cato Institute. I'm much less worried about um, the number of laws that are coming out of Washington. I'm much more worried about the way they come out. And so I'm not so much worried about the regulatory state as I am about the administrative state the fact that these laws are made through an administrative process rather than the process that the framers had, had in mind. I am so gratified, even excited. Adam is coming along. He's moving in my direction. And this shows that all of my ambitions for this paper are already coming true. Um, uh, in the Actually, Chris, you know, I usually, I mean, I usually follow the DeMuth, the DeMuth rule. If you say something, I presume to agree with it. That's why I, the paper pained me so much. I disagree with it. <laughs> no, no, no. You don't realize how, how much progress you're making, Adam. Um, <laughs> um, uh, I, 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 I do think we're going to have um, the, the, the our case is next week, right? Yeah. yeah I, I, you know, we're going to start moving on deference. We're going to start moving a little bit on uh, non-delegation. Uh, uh, but we do disagree on this. Um, I just think that the limitations are severe. The, the, the basic underlying problems of the dynamism, the secret law, the incredible power that comes with combining administration with enforcement. Um, I, I don't think that, that the words of Supreme Court decisions are uh, capable of making a radical difference. Um, but I do, but, but you made a very, very good argument. Uh, in favor of my presidential reigns idea. Uh, there are big questions about feasibility, but you were talking about when the president does things, Congress pulls back. That's exactly why I want the president to say, this is what I think we should do. It's up to Congress. Here, here it is. And then, and if, if there are howls of outrage, send him another one tomorrow and another one the next day on big, important national uh, issues. And this is, this is exactly um, uh, what Michael uh, uh, McConnell was talking about as secondary rules versus uh, primary rules. Um, I, want, I want to play uh, into that. As, as low as Congress's reputation is, you know, it's down there in the basement with news reporters and drug pushers. And so, I mean, it's just very, very low. But if you ask people, who do you think should make the laws in America? Um, Congress 
beats everybody. You get huge majorities. Congress should be making the laws. Now, this is, you know, I'm not trying to kind of imagine a reborn George Washington. I want an ambitious person that wants to be president, wants to get reelected. Play to this. We've got these big problems. Congress is dithering. You know, they're spending all their time on, uh, you know, sending, they're spending all their time um, fundraising and, uh, and running around and social networking and going on television like me. Um, and uh, I, th I want them to legislate. It, it, it's, not a, it's not a crazy idea. Uh, what President Reagan, when he was campaigning, um, he used anecdotes about idiotic federal rules and so forth. He never talked about cost-benefit analysis and OIRA review. He came to Washington. He'd made a political statement. It had found some resonance. Now he had to do something about it. He looked at, okay, guys, now what do we do? And what I want to do is just introduce this idea exactly what you want, uh, which is not to take steps that continue to uh, relieve Congress of the necessity of making decisions, but but just turning the whole system around on them because I don't see I don't I don't see it coming from the inside of Congress. It's like since we have economists in the room, it's like the old joke that ends with you know first assume a can opener. Right. I mean we haven't seen a we haven't seen a, a president this self restrained since Coolidge, maybe since James Buchanan. Um, I think we need a process that, that, um, that, a, <laughs> what did you say? What's that? What did you say? We no, no the, such a restrained president, president since, yeah. since President Buchanan. Restrained in what sense? Well, in, in that the president says, I have policies that I want, but I won't go through them in the tools, using the tools available to me. I'll just wait and see if both houses of Congress will agree with this. And it just strikes me as, mm -hmm. as utterly contrary to the assumption that we have ambitious presidents. Um, even President Trump, who's, who's restraining his agencies in so many ways that you've described, he, he's never, this has never occurred to him. Presidents of all stripes have every incentive to bring their rules to Congress, if only to get these statutes locked in as statutes. And no president has ever seen the incentives bring them towards this. And I just don't trust presidents well, enough another to be thing that a, Another thing that a president might notice is that if you get your policy in a statute, right, exactly. it's not going to be undone by the next person from the other party that uh, comes in. Tr Trump has, uh, there were certainly political calculus in it, but the, the people that wrote the Federalist Society thought it was okay to have political incentives, but on uh, uh, DAPA, on the uh, unauthorized Obamacare appropriations, it's not just that he undid what Obama had done unilaterally. He said, if Congress passes this, we'll do it. But Congress has to pass it. They were explicit constitutional decisions that he made. He said, if Congress passes this, I'll do it. However, if they pass it, there are a couple other things that I want as part of that. What's wrong with that? Well, he didn't, but he didn't so, do it on the things he really cared about. Let, let, let me interrupt. Uh, we, we have a, a few minutes left, about 15, that we can uh, devote to discussion. I want to open up with a, que with a particular question because something has been during your discussion of occurring to me, which is, suppose that you did get that Peter Wallison's prediction that uh, Chevron deference is somehow repealed by the Supreme Court. Forget about whether it's a good idea that the president steps in in the ways you're talking about. You know, nature abhors a vacuum, right? So all of a sudden you create this new regulatory risk associated with the fact that regulatory agencies no longer have deference, wouldn't that be an opening for a president to assert precisely the kind of uh, uh, new authority that you're talking about? Because it might be that this would be something that would be, have broad support as a way to reduce regulatory risk. What, what is the counterfactual? What, what would be the day after the deference gets rejected? What do people do to reduce regulatory risk, compliance risk? What do you do if not that? And since the president's the one with the energy, uh, wouldn't he be the likely person to lead the initiative to address the new regulatory risk and use that actually as a motivator for precisely the kinds of things you're talking about? Mm -hmm. So forget about the normative. Is, isn't that a, a positively likely thing to happen? Uh, uh, <laughs> it might. Uh, less court deference introduces the following risk. 
uh, that the laws we live under um, will be reviewed and will need to be approved by, uh, uh, by some people who are not part of the executive team. And sometimes they'll agree, sometimes they'll disagree. But they're much more likely, but there will be more decisions of the executive branch that will be overturned uh, as excessive or exceeding, exceeding statutory authority because it's not just people that are on the Trump or Obama team making that decision, no. but it's independent people who will disagree sometimes. But, but, and, but that strikes me as, I would call that the rule of law. But I was just saying, you, you were saying, oh, it sounds unlikely that the president would have the incentive to implement particularly this last idea of uh, sort of sending things to Congress and requiring them to vote on it, and Congress is always resistant to wanting to vote on it. But my point is, the day after you repeal Chevron deference, that changes the way Congress feels about not wanting to respond positively to that, right? Because now there's a cost to not responding. So doesn't that strengthen <coughs> the, the president's hand in being able to argue that there's a need for some kind of positive approval process by Congress that he could oversee in precisely the way you're suggesting? Mm -hmm. Otherwise, what is the other way that that plays out? So anyway, it's an open well, question. Well, we can move to other things. Yeah. I, I think that the congressional response to, let's just call it for simplicity, repeal of Chevron is, is much more ambiguous uh, than we're assuming it to be. Um, I think that a lot of, just consider a conservative Republican uh, who is in a markup session on a regulatory bill and uh, there is some uh, ambiguous or overbroad uh, standard in the world of Chevron is going to be much more likely to vote against it because he knows what the dynamics are once it gets out to a missionary agency. Uh, and if if the if a Article Three court is going to be reviewing everything that happens under it, I think that you could you could imagine that Republicans would be more inclined to go along with regulatory growth uh, because there will be this check that does not exist now. So will that be determinative? I don't know, but it'll, it will be a tendency. Clarification of what you mean by overturning Chevron. If it goes back to Congress, can Congress not say, no, we like Chevron, and they can legislate appropriately? And then we're back in the same boat we were in. And it seems to me that Congress has every incentive to do that because they don't want to be all this responsive. They, they like the vagueness. Right. Do you know what the New Dealers idea of uh, judicial review, ideal judicial review was? No judicial review. <laughs> so that's real deference. Yeah, but, I, but I, I just want clarification. What do we mean by overturning this thing? Because it's, got to, it's not as if they're saying to Congress, it's unconstitutional for you to delegate this authority. Now, then it comes back to Adam's point about not... You're thinking of non-delegation. No, I am thinking okay. of non-delegation. I think it comes back to non-delegation because once you get rid of Chevron, if either Congress can say, no, we like Chevron and pass legislation appropriately, or they can't because the law says you can't even write a law that way, which would be the non-delegation right. non principle. Ilya Shapiro from Cato. Um, and Adam, you might be surprised to know that uh, I'm less concerned about the number of laws coming out of uh, Congress than uh, how they're passed as well, because through this dynamic that, that you all have been discussing, if, um, whether through the non-delegation doctrine or you know, major questions, deference, whatever, you fix all that hydraulically or otherwise, uh, and Congress is forced to take responsibility for whatever laws it passes, it would pass fewer of them anyway, and they'd likely be better, and we can debate that, and it would be a much healthier uh, political process. But my question is um, about that particular hydraulic uh, method. Do you think there's something to that? I mean, that, I, I, I found that a uh, really fascinating part of Gorsuch's opinion uh, in, in Gundy. Does, you know, we, we have lots of, uh, of panels and conferences about... Uh, about Chevron, about non-delegation, even about you know Commerce Clause and federalism and stuff like that. Um, is all of that less important, more academic, literally? Uh, and you know the court will find a way to rebalance if, uh, if there's a, a critical mass of justices who want to go there, and we shouldn't want, we shouldn't sweat uh, the, the the categories that it puts all of this under. I think if the Supreme Court was nine Neil Gorsuch's. Um, uh, they would have trouble with non-delegation. I mean, there's, there's, and I think that the current court uh, 
uh, will move in that direction. The, the Gundy case itself, I think, would have won a couple of the people that were in the plurality against it if they weren't worried about where, where, it, would, where it would lead. Because it was a very, I mean, it was just, it was like Mistrella. I mean, it was just a case where the level of delegation was just absurd. Um, and uh, I just, I think that the, the people uh, uh, that, uh, other than Alito, uh, that were in the, uh, the plurality, I just, I think that they're worried about where it goes. But I think if you took people who are absolutely committed about it, to it and had thought about it deeply, um, I just, they're not going to, the Supreme Court is not going to declare the regulatory state unconstitutional. It is not going to do it. But, but and more you, you can come up with clever, theory, you know, all sorts of arguments, but it is too powerful a, a force. It would be a political catastrophe for the court. Even if they just said, okay, we'll just, we'll just, you know, we'll take down EPA today, that's not going to happen. Right, right. But my, my question is more broadly than, than the non-delegation doctrine. It's would the court start forcing Congress to legislate, you know, not, not strike down existing stuff. Co uh, co Congress does not like to legislate. I mean, <clears throat> you can find, it legislates, you can find some good people, that, that's true, in both parties who want to be old-fashioned legislators. But the majority of both parties do not. And the response to the non-delegation doctrine is not going to be, oh, I hadn't thought about that. Look at this, what it says in the Constitution. We're supposed to actually go to markup sessions and make some decisions. That's not going to happen. They're going to come up with, they're going to have all sorts of second and third order moves that they will make in response to it. Uh, they'll, have other, they'll have other things to do. Uh, they, they may come up with more explicit standards. Uh, but operate through appropriations riders, through hearings, uh, and so forth. <clears throat> so I think you just have to, one of the reasons I'm skeptical about the non-delegation doctrine is that it's moving into a world, the agencies and the legislature, that like things pretty much the way they are. I'm not saying it wouldn't have no effect, not at all. You, I think it would have a, mar a marginally positive effect. Just a quick comment about Chevron, and you know, I think there are lots of good reasons to be critical of Chevron, but we shouldn't forget why Chevron began. And it began <laughs> because for about a 15-year period with David Leventhal and, and, uh, and uh, McGowan, I'm not, uh, 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 right? uh, I for, and, and Wright and Bazelon right. on the D.C. Circuit, the D.C. Circuit had basically become the regulators of America, because they could look at any statute and say, this is what it requires. And so agencies would go to the D.C. Circuit with perfectly reasonable rules, and the D.C. Circuit would say, you can't do that because we think the statute requires something else, with highly purposive, purposivist uh, uh, methodologies and so forth. Uh, Chevron, at the time, was a demo pro-democratic decision, which you know shifted authoritative, interpretative, interpretive power from the D.C. Circuit to the Reagan administration. And you know, I think today things are different for a variety of reasons. But you know, if you repeal Chevron 20 years from now, we're going to have conferences about all the terrible consequences. There are of, of rule by judges. Of rule by judges, yeah. exactly. <clears throat> oh, well, yeah, on Chevron, actually. I mean, if you think that strategic litigation, the types of which Tara was describing this morning, is a problem today, just wait until there's a day where judges don't feel bound by Chevron deference. I mean, I went from being anti Chevron to anti anti Chevron to just basically being pro Chevron for all the reasons Michael understood. We can hear the faint echoes of the laughter from Skelly Wright and David Bazelon from 40 years ago. Um, we'll see, in the absence of Chevron, we'll see more strategic litigation. We'll see more aggressive lobbying publicly of judges, um, especially district court judges. Yeah, I think there'll be some beneficial effects. That's what I'm going to say earlier. There'll be some beneficial effects on the legislative process. But the way we see the, le the judicial process change, I think, will be even starker. And so for all the reasons that Scalia said, um, I get a nickel every time I mention him since I work at the Scalia Law School, um, as long as we have broadly written statutes, I think Chevron, right, the best version of Chevron, is the only way we can really exist in that world. So a comment on Chris's paper and Adam's 
reservations about it. Basically, Adam says, well, presidents have no incentive to do any of the self-denying stuff, and that seems... Mm -hmm. Chris uh, said that, too. That seems important. <laughs> but I, as I look down the proposals, I think that's truer, less true of some than of others, because I think some of the proposals are not so much about the relationship between the executive branch and the Congress as they are rela about the relationship between the elected president and I'm going to use the term deep state, I don't really mean it with all of its tinfoil hat conspiratorial <laughs> uh, uh, baggage, but the deep state is all of the bureaucrats who serve forever uh, and, and are not and have, have no political accountability to the to the president, and in, in the clean the clearest example of that is the uh, ALJ's the the ALJ reform. I don't see why a Republican president wouldn't do that tomorrow. I think there are huge right. incentives for doing that. It seems to me uh, that this is a very clever, public spirited, easily defensible good government reform that has the effect of destabilizing one of the entrenched power centers of the deep state. And, and how about another? How about term limits for bureaucrats? I don't mean the appointed people. With advice and consent people, they can be there as long as they want. It's usually about two years. So you're saying you want to institutionalize um, the revolving door? Exactly. Exactly. Uh, so Because I think when people are there for 20 years, they they cease to be responsive to any uh, uh, political uh, uh, democratic uh, change. Just another, just a thought. I'll add that to the arsenal. That's, those are all the parts of Chris's paper that I love the best, really. Well, you know, it's what a shock that you talk about these topics over and over again, and you are always coming up with something new. I think if I asked you to do this next year, you'd say, the way that we can reform the administrative state is depend on an IMF program for the U.S. is the next, the next idea. It, it wouldn't surprise not, me. Not you could make that sound good. You could make it sound good. I know you could. Anyway, uh, so please join me in thanking uh, both Chris and